what I'd like to do um, next 20 minutes or so is talk a bit about the long-term plan, but really what I want to talk about is the, is the bigger challenge which health and care faces um, within the, the context within which the, um, uh, the long-term plan is set. And um, we've heard a little about, a bit about some of those issues in our, uh, uh, this morning already, but I think the, um, for those of us who are healthcare leaders uh, in England, we are, we are at a very crucial moment now. Long-term plan has, has kind of re-engaged the nation in the NHS as where it is betting on for, for, its, for its health and care. But we see an enormous set of challenges which 3%, 3.4% real growth over the next few years isn't going to solve if we don't do something very significant about, about the way in which uh, we deliver health care. So we see the pressures on health um, and care um, around the world, and we see them uh, in the UK, being driven by perhaps three things. Firstly, public expectation. The public is expecting it, uh, the sense of um, gratitude that the NHS happens to be there for you. Um, patients are always uh, wildly grateful for the care, the brilliant care that they get from doctors and nurses and other professionals within, within the NHS, but the public as a whole that are pay, uh, paying for, uh, for the NHS. Their expectation is not to be grateful that it's there, it's that they're, that they're paying for this and that, and, the, and that it should meet the same standards they see from other services. So that creates a pressure on us. New technology, not just IT is new technology, but more importantly, the new technology of new treatments, new methods, new diagnosis, new drugs, create a huge financial pressure on, on health systems. Uh, we can keep people alive who 10 years ago would have died, tiny babies who wouldn't have survived now live. That is a tremendous contribution to society um, and a tremendous cost on, on, on the health service. Um, and the challenge of ageing, and I'm going to talk more about that, but the dynamic of our society is changing very significantly around us. Um, and the way in which we have constructed the NHS um, over the last 70 years the, uh, of reactive, something goes wrong, the NHS is there for you, um, based around face-to-face -face contacts, whether it's with your GP, whether it's in an A&E department, whether it's an outpatient department, about someone coming to see a clinical professional and us delivering our expertise and then them going away, um, and about bed-based, about taking people away into hospitals or into care homes at, at, at um, places of, uh, of safety quite frequently, um, means that we have got ourselves into a position where very many of our patients are in the wrong place. If you do the analysis, um, walk around any general hospital in England, in fact, walk around any general hospital in any developed, uh, health, uh, developed country's health system, and what you'll find is something like a third of the people lying in a hospital bed at any moment in time don't need to be in hospital. It's not that they don't need anything, it's that they're not actually receiving uh, from a hospital something that they couldn't receive in a lower acuity, more appropriate um, uh, location. Um, about half of those people are in hospital simply because they have dementia. Uh, we're not curing them, we're not treating them for an infection, we are simply keeping them in a, in a place of safety. About 14,000 beds any moment in time with people in hospital uh, with dementia. Um, and it's not just, um, in fact, it's not even primarily the resource question that that creates, it's the deprivation of liberty that that is. It's the fact that people decompensate while they're in hospital. They come into hospital, when they go home we may have done a great job for them, but they go home uh, more fragile than when they came in, particularly frail elderly people. So um, we have both an economic and a moral challenge about why we are warehousing people in, on elderly care wards uh, because we can't get our act together to care for them in another way. GPs say that around a quarter of the patients who walk into a GP surgery needed some sort of support, but they didn't need to see a, a, a general practitioner. Studies we've done in A&E departments show that up to half of the people walking into an A&E department didn't need to come to an A&E. A a telephone conversation, a conversation with a pharmacist, seeing their GP, seeing a practice nurse, having good access to the information they need on, online, all of those things would have made them not need to go to, to an A&E department. Um, and uh, perhaps most outrageously, two-thirds two of people say that they would choose to spend their last days um, 
at home with their family around them before they die, and yet we managed to make that true for about a quarter of people. So we are keeping people in their last days in hospital because we can't get our act together to give them what their, la their last wishes are. So we have a huge challenge, and the long-term plan has kind of recognised that we have to make that fundamental shift in the way in which healthcare is, is delivered. So we talk about um, the NHS becoming digital first for most care. The, we now have uh, about 20% of contact with, uh, with our 111 telephone-based call line is actually online first. People self-triaging through the algorithm that, that, that is either on the app or is online. We're trying to create an integrated urgent care service so that when you make a first contact, we can give you advice or we can steer you to the right place, including boots, if that's the right place for you to go to. Um, and if you ring up 111 and the answer is that you need a prescription, it would be really nice if the next contact you had was with a pharmacist fulfilling the prescription rather than your next contact was back in a GP surgery and A&E department, someone writing you a prescription. So, so actually trying to join up our urgent care services. Um, we've made a commitment to reduce outpatient um, contacts in hospital by a third. Um, that's a mixture of things. That's a... Uh, unnecessary follow-up appointments, just appointments that didn't need to happen. It's supporting patients to care for themselves differently in order that they don't have to continuously come back into outpatients. And it's the use of technology to offer video consultations, remote consultation for people so they don't have to drive and park in the car park of the hospital when they could go um, to, their, uh, to their GP surgery to connect to the hospital or even connect from technology at home. So... Um, creating a, uh, a different view of how we care for people in place and building around that what I think is a generational shift in the way in which the NHS is funded and we're expecting it to be managed around integrated care systems, around place and around primary care networks to say we need to move now. As we move away from perhaps the challenge of the early 2000s, which was about access and waiting lists, to the challenge today, which is around long-term conditions and ageing, how do we make sure that all parts of the health system are not competing with each other, but are actually joined up and focused on the needs of the people who are around a, a cluster of GPs at a sort of 50,000 network level, or the people in a town, the people of Bradford or Barnsley or Brighton, what is it that we should be doing for those people? Or what is the strategy for a population of a million people to make sure we have the workforce that we need? But that approach to an integrated um, care, and when we say integrated care, that's not a label, it means that if you're a patient, the care is integrated around you, and as a confused, frail, elderly person, we're not saying, oh, and by the way, you're your own care manager. Please unpick the NHS because it was too complicated for us to sort it out for you. So, and when we think about the ageing problem and the ageing challenge we face, and we are not alone in this, in fact, some European countries have even greater points, we just need to get the scale of this. At the moment... Um, about 2 in 10,000 people are over the age of 100, so that's about 15,000. In 20 years, it'll be 2 in 1,000. So 10 times increase, it'll be 150,000 people. The first person to live to 150 has already been born somewhere in the world. If we continue to deliver the model of medicine we have at the moment, that person will live to 150, and they will spend 75 years living independently and 75 years on a geriatric ward. That's a shitty quality of life, <laughs> and it's not affordable. So we need to make the, ask ourselves the challenge, what is the combination of what medicine will do to cure stuff that we can't cure today, what is our fundamental redesign of service, and what is the redesign of, uh, of our health systems that will allow that to be a different future? There'll be a different future in... Uh, 10 years' time, in 20 years' time, and in 100 years' time. But the step today, the speed at which the changing demographic of the population, which is both a quality of care and a quality of life issue, but it's also, or, also a finance issue. <coughs> you think back to when um, my dad left school, it was typical to leave school at 16, work till you were 65, and die 10 years after you retired. Just the maths say... That's two-thirds of your life paying taxes and contributing to the running of state services and one-third of your life receiving them back out again. Now it's difficult to stay at school till 20 or older, to work for 40 years, retire at 60 and live for 80 years, uh, for, to live till you're 80 for another 20 years. So that's a shift which now says that people are paying taxes for half their life 
and consuming services for the other half of their life, just to move from two-thirds, one-third to half and half, and we're still travelling in that direction. Do the math. If we keep doing what we've always done, we will spend the next 10 years of the NHS living in financial crisis as opposed to driving through the innovation. So we have a real and present danger, and so the long-term plan maps some of that out. But really, the way this needs to be mapped out is in your heads. You need to think this stuff through. You need to say, what do we really need to do for our town or our place in, or in order to make the changes that will make the NHS sustainable in the long term? And as an economist, it comes down to um, the efficient allocation of resources and the efficient delivery of services. Um, we have to have brilliant, efficient, effective services delivered by health and social care that are wrapped around patients. Um, it is always a, 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 it's always a challenge for both the public and, I say, for politicians to understand that three things can be true at the same time. Um, that the NHS can be the most efficient health system in the world, and um, I think it's challenging at the moment to claim it's the best health system in the world, but I think you can make an, a, good quali a good claim on it being the most efficient health system in the world, um, to say it's in financial crisis almost all of the time and there is waste everywhere you look. And these three things can be true simultaneously. So we shouldn't rest on our, um, our laurels, but we should also be proud. We should be proud of what we've achieved so far and what we deliver for the country, but also that there is more to do and every day there is more to do. There is, um, we saw some chants from Sir Terence earlier about unwarranted variation. The biggest thing we could do in the delivery of health care would be the removal of unwarranted uh, uh, variation. If we moved everybody, if we moved the bottom half to the average, we would save tens of billions of pounds uh, and improve outcomes and save lives and improve patient experience. So we should not be complacent. Of course, there's always a distribution curve. Somebody has to be worse than average. I remember when I worked for the Secretary of State, um, when we first published the star ratings, and the Daily Mail said, outrage, half the NHS hospitals are worse than average. Um, <laughs> so we do need to live with the consequences of transparency, but um, if you're worse than average, you need to ask yourself why. Be better than average and let everyone else worry about how they're in the bottom half. Um, we have inappropriate admissions. The variation is enormous. We have inappropriate referrals in, in, into hospital. Look at the data between GPs in Liverpool and GPs in central Manchester. Basically the same catchment areas, massive differences in the number of uh, referrals from GPs in, in, into, uh, into hospital outpatients. That's only history and culture. Look at the number of patients with learning disabilities in hospital in the north of England versus in hospital in the south of England. That's just culture. There isn't a clinical difference there. That is just unwarranted variation. We have to drive that out. We need to think about what pathways uh, look like when what we're doing is supporting clinical teams to support families, to support people in their own homes and in their own lives, rather than waiting for people to come to us. We need to understand why it is that we are still not lean, why we still have um, more time in A&E is waiting for something to happen than is actually involves either a diagnosis or a clinical intervention going on. If you look at somebody who's waited in A&E for four hours, the chances are that something's actually been happening for about an hour. The other three hours, they've been waiting for the handover to be completed to the next professional. Um, and we need to think about our workforce. We need to move on from agonising about not having the right number of people and say, well, if this is what the world's going to look like in the future, how does technology and how does pathway redesign and how does rethinking the questions um, take us forward? And, and I think that um, GS1 is in exactly the right place for this. It is a key part of the drive which Matt Hancock has brought with him to be ever more robust about standards. Not standards are good things to follow, but if you don't follow these standards, you don't get funded. Um, I'm, uh, I think the, uh, the go live of EPIC at, at UCLH is a triumph. I hope it carries on being a triumph. But the, um, uh, uh, we are getting to the point now where the major suppliers can point to triumphs. That if it's gone wrong, it must be something we've done, because now the major suppliers can prove that these systems work. But we will also be twisting at the arms of Epic and the other major suppliers to say, these standards are no longer optional extras, tick the box on the procurement and then forget about it. We are actually going to hold them to account for delivering these. And we'll be saying to the NHS, look what's happened. I was in, um, I was in Wakefield um, two Fridays ago at... Um, 
the South West Yorkshire uh, Partnership Foundation Trust who are implementing uh, DS1 uh, everywhere I went. Every wall I looked at had got a barcode stuck to it. Uh, Rob Webster, the chief executive, went, yeah, there's barcodes absolutely everywhere now. Is it? So w this is being rolled out. Organisations are adopting it. It is being driven through. And, and it fits into the wider long-term plan commitment that... Um, that we will move to data capture as a byproduct of care, but more importantly, that we will digitise the NHS and the core parts of our strategy, that we will digitise the clinical process in a way that supports the clinical process, that supports clinicians, be they uh, a district nurse in someone's home or a cardiac surgeon in the operating theatre, that the, we will capture the data and we will support them in, in, in providing care. We will join that up across the venues of care so we can design care around where the individual should receive care, not around where the data is for them, and that we will make patients have access to that information, that we will empower patients to manage their own health and their own care and to be able to be uh, equal partners in decisions about their lives. Those things tie in with a desperate need for us to, to drive standards, but also the desperate need for us to move to the next generation of health care. And I think that, oh, we just talked, touched on research earlier, but we are moving as we digitise the content, and um, I sometimes do a talk about the NHS's iPod moment, but the thing, we need, the thing that we can learn from what's happened in other industries, and I, I like to think of the music industry, because... Um, uh, when I was doing my A-levels, I was working in a hi-fi shop, and I remember the first ever CD player being delivered. I think there's just a few old men in the room who can remember that as well. The first CD uh, players being delivered. Uh, and the industry thought it was a transformation, moving from big plastic to small plastic, plastic you can play in your car. What they missed was it was never about the plastic. It was about digitising the content. And the companies that reinvented the music industry from analogue to digital, most of them have gone bankrupt since. Because once you digitise the content, you manage to, move, you manage to get the, uh, the environment where it was possible to have the iPod, you drove the, the uh, financial model for the iPhone, and you end up with Spotify and Apple Music, and my children thinking that I'm mad wanting to own an album, why do you want the rubbish owl songs as well? You can just have the good ones. So, but in the space of about 10 years, 200 years of copyright law got blown up. The entire economics of the music industry got transformed, and we are teetering on the brink of that for healthcare now. As we digitise the content, Research will change. New things will be discovered. The, the, the translational state of, of research will go from um, 18 years for half the doctors to adopt best practice to an instantaneous, we now have the evidence to say that this triage algorithm works better than that triage algorithm. At 5 a.m. on a Monday morning in UCLH, they've turned the new triage album, uh, 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 algorithm on in, a, in their EPIC system, and nurses are capturing different data and making different decisions to what they were making uh, half an hour earlier. And that, and that ability to drive evidence from gathering data in real time, studying the data, testing it live without touching a patient to see whether we could predict that, that. How good were we at predicting that somebody had got sepsis from this data? And when we know it works, being able to drop it into the workflow will change the way in which healthcare is delivered. And it won't only be in the hospital. The land, I think we now need to be thinking about the whole of a system. How do we help people stay well? How do we, how do we help... A patient like Susie, who's had cardiac surgery, post her surgery, to go home and have the tools to stay fit. The, um, the step counter um, and the digital scales and the blood pressure cuff that allows us to say, wear your step counter, stand on a set of scales every morning and check your blood pressure in the afternoon. And the algorithm running in the cloud is watching that data coming in quietly in the background. And if she's not doing the exercise regime that the nurse told her that she should do to help her recover, it nudges. It sends a message to her phone going, you're supposed to be walking 400 yards a day and you haven't been for a walk today. Just go out and do yourself some exercise. It's good for you. If the algorithm picks up that her weight has started to rise, the alert can go to the, uh, to the practice nurse to say, I think Susie may not be taking a diuretic medication. She may be um, starting to retain water. And 
Either we get that right, or the next time we see her, it'll be in an A&E department. Or she's, we're watching her blood pressure, and blood pressure is erratic or in the wrong place. And it goes, sends an alert to a doctor, and a lot doctor rings and says, Susie, I think I need to see you. This is, there's something going on here. But the ability to be able to wrap around people's lives and to change the compact between the NHS and the public from something that's where, there when you need it to something that's there all of the time that is supporting you to maintain your life, maintain your liberty, stay well, have a healthy 150 years, and be enveloped in our ability to help you manage your wellness and manage your long-term condition is the direction of travel. And it isn't science fiction, and it's not... Um, Dr. McCoy anymore, if we don't grasp this now, we won't be where we need to be in five years' time, and in ten years' time, that ageing population will overwhelm us all. So this is a huge challenge. The work you're doing is, is the work we need to do, and I thank you all very much.